Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 12 of the Paranormal Nothing podcast. And welcome to this uh, ep- format of this episode, similar to our original episodes, where I kind of wanted to just talk about this case uh, live in person just because there's so much to this case and um, it, it it would be good to kind of do a narrative like I've done with the uh, last few episodes, but I kind of wanted to just go back to the old format just because of the nature of the content and how much information there is to talk about the, this case, which I'm sure uh, most of you are, you know, that hear this podcast will know about the Skinwalker Ranch. And there really is, um, you know, I can't, I can't do the episode justice, I think, just by doing a narrative. And I also can't do the episode justice uh, by kind of warning you that I'm going to try to cover as much as I can about the case. Um, I've read a lot about the case, heard a lot about the case, watched some shows about the case. And then I've got some my own, my own opinions about it. So it's not anything that's going to be brand new, but at the same time, uh, I'm going to give you my own perspectives just based on uh, the wide variety of, of reading I've done about it and uh, reading I've done about other other topics, other areas that I think connect to the case, um, such as psychology, <clears throat> excuse me, psychotherapy, um, mythology, um, even religion. So some, some of these areas actually, I, I believe, do have a connection to what's going on at, at Skinwalker Ranch. So that'll be the extent of today's episode. So please, um, if you haven't listened to any of the other episodes that I've done, uh, more on the narrative style, please do so. Uh, such as the uh, the Peter Peter um, Stump, the werewolf at Bedberg, and then the most recent one I did, which was on the sinencephali. Um, again, kind of uh, hearkening back to episode one uh, with regards to dogmen, dogmen and dogman. So um, the next few episodes, I don't know how I'll do them, but if the content um, kind of lends itself to something like this, uh, where I'm going to just talk to you about the case uh, rather than show you. Um, just, you know, thumbnail. I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to show you different pictures, uh, different things about the Skinwalker Ranch case. So please feel free again to comment. If you haven't done so, please subscribe and like and sign up for notifications to kind of find out when I when I put out these videos. Um, I know in other episodes I haven't mentioned, but my name is Juan Quiroz. I live on the West Coast in California and um, I've always been interested, again, in, in anything related to the paranormal I've got a technical background in computer science um, and in mathematics, and um, I try to again to kind of bring my my background into into this podcast, and it's kind of grown a lot from day one. So, before I you know I don't want to talk any more about myself, but I want to just get right into the case. So, again, today's episode will be a deep dive into Skinwalker Ranch. So to start it off, this is a picture of again. The most famous book on the case, Hunt for the Skinwalker, written by Colm Kelleher and George Knapp. So about, I'd say like three months ago, I finally got around to finishing the book. I actually bought it back when it came out in 2005. I was finishing up college and I had it on my bookshelf for a long time to the point that I I was moving and I ended up selling the copy I had back then. And I believe I had a hardcover back then. So recently I, I decided to buy it again, uh, paperback, and I finally finished it a few months ago. So if you haven't done so, I'd highly recommend that you read that book. It is probably the uh, the one that kind of got the case on the map. Uh, it's very, very well written. Um, it's written by different authors. As you could see, there's two authors. So you could kind of tell their writing styles a little bit um, differently or, or, or a little bit different. And you could kind of see the difference as you're reading it. Um, but when, when I heard about the book back in 2005, the reason why I bought it, uh, one, well, I was, again, um, very, very much into the paranormal. And being in California, you know, the, the ranch itself is in Utah. I, you know, I, I thought, hmm, you know, it would be interesting to maybe head out there at some point. Uh, again, it's not very far away from where I am. But I, I never got to do that. But... In 2005, when the book came out, I had already heard about the case um, because of uh, Coast to Coast. So Coast to Coast AM uh, is what kind of also introduced the case to to most people. 
Um, and then also, again, when this once this book was written, because of George Knapp. So if you're not familiar with who George Knapp is, um, that's a picture of him right now on the screen. He is, again, uh, famous. That He's kind of known as the UFO reporter, mainstream reporter for news station in Las Vegas. But he's also more recently been in the news a lot because of the uh, Bob Lazar and the Nimitz case and David Fravor and all of that um, in situation going on right now with um, possible UFO disclosure, which I'm not going to get into too much, but I will in extent because uh, it kind of is connected to to what's going on um, with with the Skinwalker Ranch. Some of the, some of the people in the uh, UFO disclosure movement that we've seen recently are actually players in the Skinwalker Ranch case. So I think that will come kind of come into play as we talk about um, the the case uh, further on. But yeah, so George Knapp again. He's one of the writers of this book, and again, he's kind of a host of Coast to Coast occasionally. But this guy here, Jeremy Corbell, he is uh, the recent uh, director of the movie Hunt for the Skinwalker, which I believe, um, I haven't seen it, but, um, I, and again, I don't, I'm not trying to discredit anybody, but he doesn't, he, you know, when I've heard him recently on Joe Rogan's podcast, uh, when I've heard him, when I've seen some of his movies, even the Bob Lazar movie, very well made movie, but he he kind of strikes me as a salesman, which I think again that's his role. He's a salesman. He's trying to sell his movies, but I really enjoy the people that he gets to to talk to the camera, like Bob Lazar. Um, and then again for the hunt for the skinwalk hunt for the skinwalker movie, he actually d- did get to go to the site together with George Knapp and and kind of see, for us to see that firsthand was pretty interesting. Although I haven't seen it, but I understand that's what the movie shows. Um, but, uh, so so his his recent movie is kind of what also made this case uh, recently kind of blow up again. In addition to, again, the Bob Bigelow stuff, which we'll get to in a second. Okay, So I'm kind of giving you an introduction as to first why the, uh, how, how this case came to be. But then I'm going to kind of talk a little more about the details um, about the case and some of the players in the case itself, not not in actually bringing the case to light, but in the case itself. So this guy, this is another picture here. This guy's name is MJ Benias, Benias, I believe that's how you say his name. And he's got a really, really good article out there on vice.com. If you're not familiar with the vice, not the vice channel, but the uh, vice um, magazine. And He's he's a UFO guy, but he's also kind of a mainstream guy. Um, he seems like a really intelligent dude. Um, he he, I've heard him on a few different podcasts, and I've heard and I've read a lot of his pieces online. Uh, very very thoughtful approach to the to the um, Skinwalker Ranch case. The picture you're seeing is actually from that Vice article, and it's actually on the ranch itself. So this is a dog that belongs to the ranch, lives there on the ranch. And he did, he did get to go and see the ranch. And some of the stuff I'm going to talk about today is pulled from that article. So I think it's pretty... Uh, so if you haven't read that, I'm going to link to it on the show notes uh, to that article as well. So you can you could take a look at it and uh, kind of come up with your own conclusions once I'm done going over the case and giving you my own conclusions. So to start off, um, for those of you, again, that are maybe not familiar with uh, the West Coast, the, the Western states, let's say, um, if you are familiar, let's say, with Utah, um, and let's say even with Salt Lake City, uh, again, the Jazz play there, I'm a big basketball fan. Um, Salt Lake City compared to where the ranch is. And you notice that uh, on the right side, it says adamantium, right? It kind of reminds you of uh, Wolverine, if you're familiar with the uh, Marble series. Adamantium is the company that recently bought the ranch. So it used to be called the uh, Sherman Ranch or... Uh, and it was owned by Bob Bigelow, who was a big uh, aerospace guy, and uh, he's kind of, kind of a uh, reminds me a lot of like Howard Hughes in that in the sense that he's kind of a secluded personality. He's 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 a guy that funds a lot of these um, projects. Uh, so some can call them black budget projects, or even uh, you know hidden technology projects that, unfortunately, doesn't let that technology come out to light. Um, we've seen that with the we seen it we see it now even with the the current um, the Nimitz case and with the uh, uh, Tic Tac case as they call it uh, his name is is in there and uh, Harry Reid as well has mentioned you know that he has connections with Bob Bigelow 
And uh, so Bob Bigelow sold the ranch not that long ago, actually, to this company. Um, now they've renamed it Adamantium. So we're going to get into that I- I- along the lines of today's story. But just to give you a geographic perspective, if you were to Google Sherman Ranch, um, this is what you'll get. You'll get you know the, the pin drop on the right side. It's Adamantium. And then I'm just giving you a perspective with relation to Salt Lake City where it is. And it's a good distance drive. Okay. Um, not that long ago, I, I was planning actually on heading to Zion. And I thought about maybe I could swing by um, the, the ranch from Salt Lake City after swinging by. And it was five, six hour drive. Um, and as you can see, it's pretty remote. So it's not something that you would go to just, you know, let's say today and come back today. Uh, if you're leaving from California, it's a good drive. So it's a, it's a very remote place. And because of its remoteness, um, as you can see here in this picture, this is a picture of, of, the, of the canyon, of the basin where, where the ranch is located. Um, the Uinta Basin, they call it. Uh, that's kind of where the word Utah comes from, Uinta, Utah. The Utes, the Ute Indian tribe, uh, kind of inhabited this area in, in, you know, in previous times. As you could see, if, if you're familiar even with driving to Las Vegas or anywhere near Las Vegas, similar terrain, You've got, you know, the kind of the rolling mountains, very, very dry, but then you've got areas of green. Um, and again, because of the of the nature of, of the area, uh, again, you kind of have a lot of um, stories about different um, types of an- anomalies and, and that happens in this in this area, aside from just Skinwalker. So the Skinwalker Ranch, and we'll get it into as well why it's called the Skinwalker Ranch. Um, this next picture, again, this is another picture taken from that MJ Benias article on Vice, what I, which I've linked to in the show notes. And this is one of the homesteads um, on the site. So as you can see, this is taken in the winter or maybe late late fall. Um, but there's some snow on the ground, and it looks beautiful. I mean, it looks like very peaceful. Uh, the kind of the the nature of the rocks themselves, uh, the... The, the striation on the rocks kind of remind me of, again, of the Grand Canyon, if you've been there. Um, and it's not that far away from, from this area. So this is another picture, again, taken from that article. And it's another uh, river that kind of um, snakes through the property on Skinwalker. So the, the ranch itself, it really is a big, big property. So it's not something that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with like any like ranches in, in um, Texas or in uh, um, maybe even in Mexico, you have these very large, large haciendas, uh, large properties where, yeah, there are homes strewn throughout and there are um, maybe uh, service facilities strewn throughout, uh, different different types of buildings throughout the, the very, very large property. There could be, um, you know, uh, place, uh, places to, to kind of keep cattle, keep, horse, keep horses, keep livestock. So it's not even... Uh, it's not necessarily a farm, but it's a just big, big property with different things going on. Um, you could probably go from end to end. You know, it takes you a few hours um, in so, some of these some of these like uh, ranches in the in the southwest southwestern United States and also in Mexico. So this picture here that you're seeing, um, if you can Google just the U- Uinta Basin, the Ute Indians, these are the original inhabitants of, of this area. So. Another picture here. Um, the, these these individuals again. Th- these pictures are very very um, they're, they're very clear actually uh, for for their age, and they they show kind of the again the original inhabitants of of the area. And what's interesting is that um, you know the the legend I guess or the theory the concept of what a skinwalker is. So if you're not familiar with what a skinwalker is. Um, that's um, this is a, this is kind of a nice illustration I I've seen throughout the internet. Uh, somebody must somebody might have drawn it. Really really nice job on it. And they talk about um, you know uh, b- basically that most Native American tribes, particularly those again in in the United States, they've got kind of a story about about a skinwalker. So a skinwalker is somebody who goes through some kind of ritual. Uh, I've read where some some of these rituals involve let's say rubbing a black magical ointment on your body drinking a particular potion uh, you know saying some kind of incantation some kind of going through some kind of ritual whereas 
then you you kind of place the pelt or the the skin of an animal, a wolf or a fox or another animal, a bear, a deer. You put it on on your body after you've gone through this ritual, which maybe involves some kind of ointment or potion. And apparently, it allows you to turn into that animal and act like that animal, um, feed like that animal, um, be be kind of a if it's if it's a wolf, you know, you you'd become kind of like a werewolf, right? Or a, a were bear, even um, if it, if you're if you're turning into a bear. So that's that's basically what the skinwalker is. And from what I from what I understand too, a lot of Native Americans kind of shun speaking about, or not shun, but uh, are kind of shy about speaking about that legend. They they don't really like to talk about it, um, probably because it kind of has some negative connotations. And I myself am Catholic, and um, I know that the aspect about the skinwalker kind of turning into somebody to something kind of reminds me a little bit of kind of like demonic possession. So even in the Catholic church, you know, that is something that is real, but it's something also that people don't like to talk about too often. Um, but it, it is real. Maybe could be maybe equated to the skinwalker phenomena. So I might get into that in, later on today's, today's episode, how, um, you know, I feel that maybe this skinwalker uh, ranch could be related to, to that, but but that's that's basically what a skinwalker is, and why is this ranch called that? Because uh, again, you've got the land which this ranch sits on. Um, to, it it is it belonged to these Uinta, the the Ute tribe. It, it's it's basically a, an Indian uh, Indian land. So um, if you're familiar with some of these other, let's say there's there's a university out where I am, uh, Cal State Long Beach, where California State University Long Beach, where um, in the past, you know, I've read that it was actually built on an Indian burial ground. Um, and because of that, th- there's been stories where, you know, people have noticed uh, kind of weird phenomena, weird things going on around the campus. And not, not necessarily all over the campus, but primarily over which the burial ground is on that section of the campus. So Indian burial grounds, you build anything on top of them, <clears throat> probably not a good idea. Okay. And we don't really know, uh, again, if it's an, if it's because of a residual haunting or whatever you want to call that, you know, haunt, if you believe in hauntings, let's say. But y- there's definitely something going on if, if you know, if you're seeing things and these things happen over an Indian burial ground. So we're going to get into maybe some, some, uh, some of that into, in the explanation section. This is another picture now that you're seeing here of Terry Sherman, um, a.k.a. Tom Gorman. So if you read the book, The Hunt for the Skinwalker, you'll notice that it's that the, the main protagonist in the in the book, which is, again, a, it's a nonfiction book, but they, you kind of give the main character a fiction, fictionalized name. Uh, in the book, his name is Tom Gorman, uh, real life Terry Sherman. I had never actually seen a picture of him until I started to research this episode. And I found this picture on a really nice website, um, I believe it's put out by, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the kind of the, the the purveyors of this entire Skinwalker Ranch um, case. Uh, so I'm going to put a link to that website as well. But in it are pictures of all the main players of the case. And this is Ter- Terry Sherman. And Terry Sherman will basically be uh, the protagonist for all the stories that I'm going to tell you uh, during today's, ki- during today's um, episode. So Terry Sherman uh, and his wife, Gwen Sherman, um, according to the website skinwalkerranch.org, which is the website I mentioned that has a lot of really good information, detailed information about the case, names, dates, a timeline. Uh, Terry and Gwen bought the property in 1994. So the property itself, 400 acres, 480 acres uh, worth of ranch. And um, they bought it in 1994. And again, according to the book, The Hunt for the Skinwalker, and according to this website, they sold it to um, Bob Bigelow in uh, 1995, 1996. So the Bob Bigelow's organization titled National Institute for the Discovery of Science, a.k.a. NIDS, that's the organization that that bought it. Um, And that's kind of when more of the scientific investigation of of the ranch uh, began um after that but 
when when Terry Sherman bought it in 1990 when he, when he and when he and his wife and the, and some and their kids they moved in 1994 um basically according to the the book since even day 1 stuff started happening uh, but i i kind of want to start with telling you about the the ranch um from the perspective of Terry Sherman i kind of want to follow the book uh, hunt for the skinwalker first so in the book hunt for the skinwalker you know the the it's kind of laid out in two parts where the first part kind of talks about the history of the ranch and then it talks about all of the Sherman experiences uh, or in the book, they're the Gormans, right? Um, but in the second half of the, of the book, it's more of an investigation uh, of when Nids actually investigated the, the ranch itself. And then the third half of the book is kind of some, the author's attempts at explanations. So, it's interesting because the book, um, again, there's a lot of different stories, and I'm not going to be able to cover and tell you every single story because I, I think you should read the book because it's, it, you know, I won't do it justice. But the very first story they tell you in the book, you open it up to page one. The title of, of the cha- the title of, um, of chapter one is actually Wolf, and if you ask any of the, uh, any anybody who's interested in the case or, um. You look up any podcast about, or or video about the case. That's kind of the one of the first um, experiences that they talk about is the experience of a giant wolf who was basically invincible to bullets, invincible to um, large bullets, small bullets. So the story goes that uh, you know Terry Sherman was uh, they, they they were kind of like um, I guess you know in, in at at their property. Um, and kind of, you know, attending to the, to their cattle. So the individuals that were tending to this cattle were Tom, as I mentioned, and his son, Tad. So Ellen was also, Ellen is wife. Um, now, now, again, in real life, again, uh, his wife, Tom's, Tom's wife was named Gwen, not, not um, Ellen. But in the book, again, we're, we're kind of using pseudonyms. Um, it's uh, Ellen, Ellen Gorman, but in real life, Gwen Sherman. So Gwen, Gwen Sherman, I guess, uh, Terry Sherman and their son, Tad, they were kind of, again, taking care of the cattle and in this enclosure, when kind of about uh, 50 yards away, they noticed what looked like, you know, according to them, a wolf. So as a wolf approached them, they, again, they, they don't, they don't necessarily say that they were afraid of it of this wolf, but they they initially were a little nervous because just because of the fact that they had cattle there that obviously could have been an easy meal for this wolf. So they wanted to stay there to see what this wolf had in mind. As the wolf got closer, they noticed that it was kind of silver, gray, grayish in color, and it was extremely large for a wolf. That's that's one of the things that they noticed immediately. It was really really big for a wolf. And that it acted very, very tame, very tame behavior for a, for a wild animal. It approached them, and one of the calves apparently stuck its head through some of the, the bars in the enclosure and was looking at this wolf. The other interesting, uh, I guess, aspect of this case is that this particular um, example is that they were able to actually even pet the wolf. They pet the wolf, and it, it was kind of wet and co- it had a wet texture to it, according to, to to the family, which was kind of interesting, I think, because um, th- this wolf, again, a wild animal, nobody could ever think about petting a wolf, especially such a hulking wolf, 200, over 200 pounds, according to the book. But initially, again, the, the animal also had very, very striking blue eyes. So the, the animal itself... When I read this, and, I, and then I, when I tell you what happened next, it almost seemed kind of tricksterish to me. You know, if you're familiar with the trickster trickster archetype, or uh, Jungian Jungian psychology again, Jung, Jungian um, psychoanalysis, uh, the trickster that tries to um, not make sense of things for you, tries to play games. Th- think of poltergeist, right? Think of um, think of the court jester. And in this case, this wolf, the way this wolf acted, it's almost as if. It was uh, playing with the emotions of the Shermans in the sense that it made it made it it made itself seem tame and playful, like a little puppy, even though it was a gigantic hulking wolf. 
Um, and then also what, what I thought about when I read this is that it kind of reminded me also of Dogman. Again, like if you, if you hear our episode one of The Paranormal Nothing, you hear, you know, I kind of give you a description about the Dogman phenomena. But this particular wolf didn't walk on two legs. It wasn't an upright canine. It was walking on four legs, according to the description. But what happened What happened next is that once, the, one of the, one, once a calf kind of stuck its head through the bars, the wolf immediately, you know, initially it was tame. It wasn't trying to attack any of them. It immediately uh, clamped down on, on this calf's neck, and it wouldn't let go. So the family, you know, was hitting hitting this animal. Tom was trying to hit it. Or I'm not going to refer to them as Tom, the book, because it, then I'm, I'm getting myself confused here. So I'm going to just call them Terry, Gwen, and Tad. Or Tad, Tad is the name that the son is given in the book, but I'm just going to call them the, the Gormans. So Tom, I'm sorry, not the Gormans, Shermans. Um, Terry and Gwen were there, and they were hitting this animal with, with, with whatever they could find. So, you know, obviously, uh, Terry... Couldn't get this animal off the calf, Price calf, sh shoots the animal. The animal doesn't even flinch. Um, he asks Tad to go get him his gun, his bigger gun. So at this point, he shoots him point blank with the, with the pretty much a slug. And the animal's, a giant piece of, of flesh falls off the animal, literally. It just flies off the animal. And at that point, it finally lets go of this calf. But... Again, even after trying to hit it and shooting it multiple times, this wolf didn't did not let go. So he had to actually shoot it with with basically a slug. And at that point, the wolf did let did let go of the calf. Um, even though he let go of the calf, uh, again Terry did not want to just let the wolf go in case he came back and maybe hurt his family. So he followed the wolf. He tracked it into the uh, the, the surrounding area, and he said that. Eventually, uh, what happened is that the footprints disappeared uh, in an area that it, it would be impossible for the wolf to just all of a sudden disappear. But the footprints disappeared just, you know, no animal, just basically van vanished. So he had tracked this wolf, and then all of a sudden, it appeared that the wolf vanished. So I think with that chapter one story of it, and again, I'm kind of paraphrasing what, what the story is about, but... That story kind of already kind of sucks you in into into this into this whole uh, skinwalker phenomena because, like as I mentioned earlier, a skinwalker typically is a person that wears the pelts of a wolf and begins to act like a wolf. So, this particular creature, it it did exude intelligence, and the Shermans did say that they felt that this creature had a very high intelligence. They could they they thought it was a wolf. They the wolf obviously. It didn't act like a wolf. You know, it didn't try to attack them or it didn't try to immediately attack the calf. It almost as if it was, again, it was kind of playing a game with them, kind of letting them assume that it's not going to do anything when all of a sudden it just decided to change its mind and attack one of its calves, one of their calves. So it's a very, very trickster, trickster type element to it. Um, and at the same time, skinwalker, you know, it's, it, that's almost what, a skinwalker is said to be is somebody who can transform into uh, that animal if they wear the skins of that animal. So that's the, that's the first story called Wolf. So the book itself, again, over the next few chapters, um, you do kind of encounter more stories about cattle and about cattle disappearing, cattle mutilations, that the Shermans, obviously, the ranchers, they're actually, they're one of their their primary sources of income is actually cattle. So as the story indicates that whenever they had one cattle that had gone missing or, or one cow or a calf, um, that essentially meant that, you know, they would be missing on, missing out on, on needed income to kind of keep their house, their ranch, their homestead, their business, their family life going. So whenever they have any one of them missing, you know, it, it's basically, you got, you got to drop everything and go find it. So one of the stories in the book is that um, Tad, uh, the fictionalized name for the son, for their son, was kind of taking care of some of the some of the cattle when he noticed that one of the calves had gone missing um, and had fallen into some kind of ditch. So he goes after the the calf that's in the ditch, and in the meantime, he leaves another cow or calf um, kind of 
uh, waiting for him to come back. And it's, again, you know, real, when you're your way out there in the middle of nowhere, Tad goes and retrieves the, the, the calf that had kind of fallen in this ditch. And according to the book, it took him about 20 minutes max to actually retrieve this, this calf. So when he gets back to where he had left the other cow or calf, um, 20 minutes only had passed. He says that he kind of was in shock because he sees that something has, with you know utmost precision, has cut the rear end off of this of this cow of this calf. Uh, only, according to him, you know something, some object must have used you know 100% precision on the cut in order to cut that that you know the 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 rear end off basically uh, to hollow it out uh, of the of this animal that he had found that just 20 minutes earlier was intact. So something must have come, some some kind of technology, something that can make such a cut that almost surgical like cut in 20 minutes out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so that, that didn't make sense to Tad. So you see that case as well. You see another case again where Terry is actually chasing a cow, it looks like, that has um, kind of gotten loose. And as he's chasing it, again, we're talking about, you know, gigantic cow uh, that that Terry, the, these these cattle that Terry owns are, are prized cows, prized cattle that he uses again for for monetary reasons. So, you know, they're obviously very well fed and they're obviously uh, very well, um, you know, endowed in terms of, of weight and in, in girth. So if you could imagine one of these animals running across a pasture and then all of a sudden Terry says that he, he stopped he stopped seeing their 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 footprints, their tracks. He no longer saw it. So, what could have just all of a sudden, you know, taken a cow up in the air or eliminated the cow without any residue, without any blood anywhere, without any um, fur? I mean, any any kind of skin anywhere? It just didn't make sense to, to to Terry that this cow, as he's chasing it, as he's tracking it to bring it back to the enclosure. Will all, would all of a sudden just disappear because that's what it seemed like that it just vanished into thin, thin air just like the wolf episode so these stories that we've seen so far again primarily uh, have to do with cattle with animals cattle mutilations um, cows going missing stuff that we see maybe in some other cases throughout the, you know the American Southwest or even in um, other parts of the of, of the country where we see where we do see cattle mutilation type of phenomena which again it's not something that it's not something just unique to Skinwalker Ranch, but does happen throughout uh, different cases that, that, again, people don't know why it is that cattle mutilation does occur. That's something that, that is still a mystery. And I know Chris O'Brien, another very famous cattle mutilation investigator, he's, at, he's written a few books about it, as well as about the trickster. So I think the trickster, again, has a lot to well, has a large role in, in the Skinwalker Ranch uh, phenomena. But... Now, when we get to other kinds of phenomena, I know that when we're getting into something related to, let's say, high strangeness. So if you're familiar with the high strangeness term, it's basically when you have things like uh, Bigfoot and UFOs together. If you think of Stan Gordon's research that, that he does in Pennsylvania, where you see a UFO, but then you also see a Bigfoot. Um, and then the famous case, right, of like a, a Bigfoot hold, holding a, uh, like, I think it, I think it is like a, a golden, or not a golden, like a glowing ball coming out of a UFO. So those kinds of a mixtures uh, of different, what you would typically consider you um, paranormal phenomena, um, you you see that, that kind of stuff happening also here in in the Skinwalker case because Terry Sherman in the book he he gives an, an example where throughout the property, um, Terry as well as as his wife and and his and his son do see what what he could call, uh, or what he calls like glowing orange balls of light um, that kind of hover throughout the the property. But the, the high strangeness part is that he actually sees them coming out of what, what it could only be called like a portal, like some kind of portal in the sky. So when I think of portal, I think of like the movie Stargate. If you're familiar with Stargate, it's this kind of like a imaginary, um, it almost in the movie itself, itself it kind of looked like a, like a wall of water. When you walk through it, you enter this whole other dimension or this whole other world. So Terry, in, in the book, um, later on in the book, he kind of gives a little bit of a better description where 
in the night, you know, he sees, he, he's outside on his porch and he sees what could, you know, these, these orange balls of light coming literally out of the sky. You know, they're just coming out of the sky from, from, from nothing to somewhere. So as he, as he gets closer to the place where they, as he begins to walk towards the place where they're coming out of, he kind of, what, what, the only thing he could describe it as is that he kind of sees daylight on the other side. So then he realizes that he's looking at somewhere else where, it, where it's daytime. So it's almost like a, like a Einstein Rosenbridge, like a wormhole. If, you, if you've ever seen the movie Interstellar, or if you've read any, um, you know, let's say pop, popular science with regards to wormholes, where if you have a wormhole, technically you, can, you would be able to, if you look into the wormhole, you'd be able to see what's on the other side. Uh, it might be another galaxy or another um, universe or another dimension in this case. But Terry was a- is able to see into this quote-unquote hole that these orange balls of light are coming out of. And he sees, again, just daytime, daylight. So I think that's like the uh, one of the more high strangeness elements of, of the story that he couldn't explain what this was. And, and again, uh, he... He didn't have any other witnesses to to to, in, to kind of corroborate that. He obviously couldn't take a he didn't take a picture of that, uh, which we'll get to in a second in terms of like photographic evidence and any other kind of evidence. But another high strangeness um, element of the story, and I, I really like this element because personally, I, I'm a big fan of the of the '80s um, action movies. So in the book, they talk about Predator. And obviously, if you've seen the movie Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jesse Ventura, and Carl Weathers, you know, it's kind of a guy movie fighting fighting like a, an alien from another planet that has crashed on Earth. And these guys are trying to get out of the jungle uh, try, by, by kind of killing this alien who eventually basically kills, spoiler alert, most of the, of the team except Schwarzenegger. He ends up surviving it. But if you remember the, the way that this animal looks like, it kind of looks like a like a camouflage, like an invisible. I guess you could call it like a almost like a, a little bit of a reptile type of texture to it, and it can it could turn the camouflage on and it could turn it turn it off, you know, at will. And it's got kind of like long flowing uh, dreadlocks. It looks like, but it, it looks it's a very imposing creature in the movie. Well, in the book, Terry does give an account that when they were out and about on the ranch it appeared that they were being, if they looked on either side of the trees, um, it looks like there was some kind of creature that was kind of keeping uh, ch- keeping tab- keeping track with, on them. It was walking with them, but it hidden in the trees. And when they, when they started to look at, into, these, into this tree line, they could kind of see the shape of a, of, of a humanoid, a humanoid figure. But it could only, again, based on their description, the author of the book, uh, of, of The Hunt for the Skinwalker, said that it, it reminded them of essentially the creature from the movie Predator, that it had that type of texture, like that type of camouflage. So really, really bizarre. Um, you know, it's something that you don't... I've never read any other paranormal book where they talked about the creature or, or whatever entity is in that case looking like the Predator. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, at the same time, pretty high strangeness. Again, you've got an element of a humanoid, what appears to be kind of camouflage. So there, there's a lot of other high strangeness, stri- high strangeness accounts, and maybe we'll go into them. But I want to keep telling you some of the other stories about uh, what Terry Sherman and, and the family went through. So going back to the uh, the phenomena related to cows and cattle calves. So no, another interesting case that I remember reading about and hearing about, and even uh, George Knapp. You, know, you you could actually Google George Knapp plus Skinwalker Ranch. On YouTube, and he has a he has a really good um, couple of talks he's given where he shows pictures that he took at the ranch, um, in terms of like where the where he saw the phenomena versus uh, where the phenomena took place at. Uh, so he kind of gives you some real uh, time pictures of uh, stuff that happened in this book and where it actually took place at geographically. So you could just Google that. I'm, if I find it, I will uh, post it in the show notes. But one other case that, that is quite talked about is a case of um, the cattle that are basically, they go missing. Um, Terry Sherman can't find his cattle. I believe it's in the middle of a, of a rainstorm. And in the middle of this rainstorm, you know, his wife uh, looks, looks at Terry. 
Terry looks at his wife and, you know, they're, they're, they don't know where the cattle have gone. And they're, they're scared because, um, they, you know, again, they're prized possessions and they need to get them back all in the enclosure, uh, in, in an area that's where they can kind of keep dry and, and keep away from the rain. So Terry goes out on, in, you know, in his vehicle and looks for these cows. And when he, when he's arriving to, I guess they have kind of these large containers at the property for storage purposes, kind of like a, maybe like a modular building. Uh, when I think about a modular building, I'm thinking maybe like a, like a container where you keep um, either uh, school equipment or, or sports equipment, just this really large uh, steel container or, or, or another strong material where um, in this case, uh, again, Terry kind of had it out there for equipment, I believe. But as he approaches this container, he begins to, he begins to hear what, you know, what it looks like, what he, what it sounds like, sounds of cows. So as he approaches it, I, I believe he was upwards in, upwards of like 20 cow, cows, I believe, that he sees that have been almost, you know, surgically placed in, into this container. They are squished, but they, they've all kind of been placed inside here. How is it that they were all of a sudden were in, were in there through a very small enclosure of, of the, of the container? And they're all placed in there like sardines. He says that it just stunk really bad. But how is it that they were able to get, you know, something was able to get a bunch of different cows, different temperaments, and and again, during a rainstorm, all into this container, all of a sudden, didn't make sense. Again, that trickster element coming into play again uh, in this case, in this particular example. So that's another another interesting one. And And again, even... Even when it comes to, let's say, uh, UFO phenomena, uh, that that also was seen quite often on the property. They did see a lot of black triangles. They saw, you know, weird-looking sh- uh, ships, weird-looking objects in the distance. Another interesting uh, case that I'm just thinking about right now, off the top of my head in the book, is that they see kind of like a. If, if I think of I'm sitting on the porch of a of a big property, far off in the distance, I have a gate, gate to enter the property, and I see, let's say, a car that just stops there all of a sudden. Uh, maybe it will try to drive around my property, but then flees. Almost like a men in black type of phenomena, but apparently they they were able to see this happen often, and uh, no tracks, no tracks were left of this car. So a lot of real strange phenomena happened uh, to Terry Sherman and to his wife and to his children. So this was, again, they bought the property in 1994, and there's, there's a lot of other smaller little um, cases that happened. There's even some Bigfoot sightings they had on the property. Again, the wolf sighting. There's a couple other wolf sightings, and I'm going to get to another sighting in a second that didn't happen to Terry Sherman. But so again, this property just full of high strangeness events, full of of just all kinds of paranormal type stuff from UFO, from Bigfoot, from apparently skinwalkers, dogmen, uh, even. And, and I'll get to it in a second, too. You, you have some kind of ghost type of phenomena. But why is it that Terry Sherman did not leave earlier? Well, again, he's, he's kind of one of, those, one of these guys from the American Southwest, kind of a tough, tough cowboy type of guy. He didn't want to leave his property, especially the fact that, you know, it was uh, his livelihood. You know, he, he was going to have to leave his livelihood. So the fact that he left it, you know, only after two years because – they sold the property to the to the Bigelow, let's say the, Big, the Bigelow Nids Foundation, within a couple of years of Terry buying it. So, in a couple of years, that's all that's all that Terry was able to stay. I think that says a lot, especially you know again a tough guy. Terry appeared to be kind of these tough guys that we see, um, real macho guy, and the fact that he he left he left his pride his, his pride and joy behind. Uh, it wasn't you know whatever the family was going through. It wasn't worth it, so I think that tells a lot. So, so now we're going to talk about what what happened when uh, when Terry decided to sell the property and uh, who bought it. So by July 1996, that's the year that the uh, the Shermans basically said they they'd had enough of what was going on at the property, and um, Tom um, Bigelow Bigelow basically kind of had heard about the uh, what was going on, Robert Bigelow. And again, if you Google his name, you'll see that he's kind of connected to 
a lot of uh, UFO type research as well as mainstream aerospace research. So he's kind of a guy that he he touches a lot of different areas within the sector and particularly even in the paranormal. You know, so you you'll find that he's involved in stuff related to reverse engineering alien technology. Apparently, uh, the stuff that we're seeing now with the Nimitz and with even this uh, to the stars Academy type of type of information. Some of those people on that, on that particular organization, in that particular organization are connected to Bigelow and uh, some of the individuals from NIDS, the national Institute for discovery science. So Robert Bigelow buys it, buys a ranch again off from, from, from the Shermans uh, in 1996. And they take over the ranch itself. They kind of close it off. The first thing they do is they kind of close it off from the public. So apparently what Robert Bigelow wanted, he, he sees in the, in the ranch the perfect kind of uh, case, the perfect um, environment to really study these types of phenomena from a scientific point of view. So he, he kind of starts hiring a bunch of scientists and people with, you know, again, PhD degrees to kind of come in here and study it to study it from a scientific point of view instead of instead of you know like uh, another rancher to take care of it or maybe somebody so, somebody that can actually maintain the property rather than the for, rather than for the purpose of studying the phenomena he decides to just basically kind of close it off and make it into like a laboratory and um, that's where you hear a lot of the, a lot of these names that apparently were connected to the to the lab again Colm Kelleher is one who, who wrote this book uh, you you do see also George Knapp, uh, Colonel John Alexander. If you look up his name, he's kind of a interesting guy, kind of a jerk to be honest with you. When I've heard him interviewed uh, a few different podcasts, he seems kind of an arrogant guy. But again, apparently he was connected to this particular case. He he was involved in this case, and he he was out there doing research apparently of some some sort. And I believe he's a physicist. So they close off the ranch and. The NIDS. This, NIDS is the institute that's kind of formed uh, to some kind of like a, I believe it's it's just a, a name that somebody came up with to actually uh, give it legitimacy in studying the phenomena at the ranch. So starting in 1996, they began to set up all kinds of equipment, you know, high-tech equipment all over the ranch to monitor uh, heat signatures, to monitor, monitor sound signatures, to monitor visible signatures, anything and everything that could possibly they could possibly track with data, they began to do that. And again, we're, they're funded by uh, Robert Bigelow, Bob Bigelow, so they've got the money behind it. They got they've got the money to invest in all of that. They set up some kind of command headquarters as well, according to the book. And from there, they're able to see all the different feeds of what's going on. Um, and then again, a lot of other technicians and another a bunch of different individuals come on board for this project, but. Again, nothing is seen in, uh, out. Nothing is pushed out to the public. This is all private, and it apparently it seems that it, it's it's basically for Robert Bigelow. He wants to know what the truth behind uh, this paranormal phenomena is that's happening at the ranch. So his goal is not necessarily to share uh, the information with the the media, with the public, but it's more for his own purposes. So that's the interesting part of the case. So Robert Bigelow, again, um, he tries to keep the information to himself, and it's not necessarily for the betterment of science, but again, it's more for his own purposes and maybe for monetary gain of some sort, uh, knowing, again, he's, he's done that with other, other organizations that he's, um, he's funded. But in the case of NIDS, in terms of what actual results did they get, again, the second half of the book goes into a little more detail about stuff that they did, types of experiments they did, as well as um, some of their experiences that they had. So the experiences continued. Um, however, it appeared there it appeared though because they were they were basically hoping for that the type of phenomena to occur instantly, whenever they needed it to occur, which obviously doesn't happen. Again, this is another in trickster type of phenomena that it only occurred when obviously it wanted to occur. There was no pattern to the phenomena. There was no pattern to when it would occur and how it would occur, how it would manif manifest itself. All of the interviews I've read and heard about, all of the investigators say the same thing. They couldn't 
they couldn't pin down the pattern. And, and again, just the high strangeness elements to when NIDS was there, such as all of their, you know, top grade equipment, top grade binoculars, cameras, um, computers, it, they would they would register that there was something there. You know, maybe some heat signatures could be seen out in certain part of the ranch. But when the individuals, uh, researchers would go out there to try to capture it on film, basically their cameras would either malfunction or when they would hit record, they would record only static. Uh, nothing nothing would come through. Or if they had like SD cards, what, you know, what they used back then, SD cards or any other kind of memory card, the memory cards apparently would be blank or they were they would be unformatted or they would be missing entirely so this phenomena did not did not want apparently to to be to be recorded to be registered and if it did it 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 basically allowed a uh, registration of static or of white noise to be seen so that seems to me again very very trickster like uh, one 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 account that i remember reading that kind of was again, high strangeness, very, very high strangeness, was when a couple of the investigators during NIDS times, NIDS times there, um, they were out outside in the, in, on, in, at the ranch. And from far away, they, they saw, again, an orange light, similar to the light that Sherman, Terry Sherman had seen when he saw kind of that portal open up. But it, from this orange light, they said that they initially thought it was just like a light, but then they, as they started to focus on it with their binoculars, they could see that it was a tunnel of some sort that had all of a sudden materialized in front of them, uh, far out in the distance, but it had materialized. And they said that what they could see was that a dark humanoid shape had jumped out of the tunnel and began to run away. And by the time that they got their equipment ready to possibly take a video or snap some pictures, the figure had, had run away entirely. But I thought that was interesting because, again, it's another humanoid figure, maybe another type of Bigfoot or um, who knows, maybe like some kind of shadow person or, or something along those lines where we think of black, humanoid, dark, shady, shadowy figures uh, coming out of tunnels. That, that's what happened in this case. And again, those, those types of phenomena continued as well as the constant uh, seeing of orbs, a lot of different orbs all over the place. And again, orbs, you know, typically are signatures of, could be a type of haunting. Um, when you do see, when I've, when I've heard of other stories that contain orbs, a lot of that has to do with just negative energy or, or energy in general that, that's in that area. So it seems that in addition to the other high strangeness phenomena, you've got the more typical phenomena of orbs happening a lot. Uh, and then again, you've got like, tunnels materializing out of nowhere and figures jumping out of these tunnels. So again, the, the crew, uh, Bob Bigelow's team, encountered the same type of phenomena that the Shermans had. But the only thing is that from what I read through in, read in interviews and, and, and heard in interviews of the team, even after the fact, the only problem is that they didn't encount, in, they didn't capture as much as they hoped for. Uh, because again, the phenomena did not want to show itself when they expected it to. Uh, which was basically never because they couldn't pinpoint any kind of pattern that this phenomena had. So this went on uh, for about 20 years. So Bigelow and his NIDS team basically studied the, the ranch for about 20 years. And in 2016, Bigelow did sell the ranch to a company titled Adamantium Real Estate Holdings. So Adamantium Real Estate Holdings, I'm not sure, you know, anything about it. Um, if you Google their name, they've got, you know, some information about about the company. But it, it's interesting because this date kind of coincided with uh, back in also, you know, about a year later in 2017. Uh, that's when we learned about Luis Elizondo. Uh, he was the uh, government uh, DIA official who uh, apparently, you know, did... He visited the ranch, um, and he's now part of the, you know, Tom DeLonge's To the Stars Academy. And this, in 2017, is it's it's where $22 million were given to Bigelow and to his uh, companies uh, in order to set up what's called the Advanced Aerospace Weapons Systems Application Program, otherwise known as ASAP. ASAP. Um, and it, it was basically to study uh, UFO technology, to see, study and... And, and I quote, to study and generate reports on exotic science, 
basically UFO technology. So that that's that's uh, what Bigelow was working on. So it's interesting that that happened one year after he sold the ranch. So it's almost as if he was kind of getting ready to rid rid himself of the ranch because he was going to get into something more uh, exotic, I guess. Uh, and again, that program, the ASAP program, ASAP program, uh, ended in a couple of years. Uh, ASAP program, and then it was replaced by the ATIP program, the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, which again has been in the news because of the New York Times articles uh, in indicating that that was a real program uh, meant to study UFOs and uh, encounters with the military and how we could, you know, again see. How, um, if that was real, a real phenomenon or not. So Bigelow, again, was involved in that because of Luis Elizondo. Uh, and again, if you Google Luis Elizondo with Tom DeLonge of Blink-182 fame, you'll see that there's a connection there. So as I was indicating at the beginning of today's episode, even though we can't really make a one-to-one -one connection between the Skinwalker uh, case and what's going on right now with Disclosure, the players that are at play here are the same players, which what's interesting is that you've got, um, again, Alessandro, you've got uh, Bigelow, you have um, now, you know, you've got Commander David Fravor, uh, Bruce Maccabee, uh, one of the, you've got, um, uh, even even to an extent, again, you've got Harry Reid, who's one of the, the government officials, was involved in the Skinwalker, apparently. He, he toured the Skinwalker Ranch. And now he is the one that's kind of pushing for funding for these programs to uh, legitimize uh, the study of, of UFO or, or UAP, as some call it. But again, now that the ranch was sold to Adamantium Real Estate Holdings in 2016, it looks like the information is not as uh, uh, you know kept kept for, uh, for private purposes. Now you see a lot of shows like the the show that we see now on cable about the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, and again, I think I think that one reminds me a lot of Ghost Hunters, real fake. Um, it's just meant for to, to kind of get information um, out to the mass public, but it's not anything of value. It's more just for show, uh, to kind of attract clicks or to you know attract viewership. But in terms of real hardcore science, I think that went away with Bigelow, uh, just because Bigelow kind of kept it to himself. And I think that's a sign that he was really trying to even if it was for himself, he was really trying to find out what was going on. Um, now with all these shows and uh, even with the movie The Hunt for the Skinwalker, you know, although it, it makes it easy for, let's say, myself, the, the public, to see what's going on at the ranch, I might, I might be only seeing what, the, what they want me to see, obviously. And, and, and we're not really seeing uh, more uh, sci scientific level, like real deep science types of research that we could, we could get more information from. But I mean, if that's the case, at least you know we're getting we're getting some kind of information from that because otherwise we wouldn't be getting anything. But but because of you know again Adamantium Real Estate Holdings, uh, if you, if you do click on the Vice.com article that I'm that I'm going to link in the show notes, you'll see that uh, M J Benias Benias did write a really good detailed article about his visit to the site. Now that it's owned by a different company and he was able to get access to it. And in in the article, they talk about one particular uh, individual, um, and he's kind of the head of security there. His name is Bryant Arnold. He's the head of security at Skinwalker Ranch, and he did give M. Jebanias the an interview. And when you click on the article, he kind of and like I'm showing you here as a, as a picture. He he's got like a, a machine gun, you know. He's got a big rifle, not a machine gun, a rifle, um, kind of taking a picture, he, let, he lets MJ Benias or the photographer take a picture of him standing in front of the gate to Skinwalker Ranch. So he's a kind of an imposing guy, but um, in the article, it talks about a couple instances where he says, you know, that he really feels that there is stuff going on at the ranch. You know, he talks about that they'll sometimes get weird EMF field readings throughout the ranch, uh, RF spikes, so radio frequency spikes, all of a sudden, without any kind of um, interference because because of the remoteness of the ranch, um, there really isn't any other radio radio signals uh, that could possibly uh, be interfering. So the fact that they get these all of a sudden anomalous RF spikes kind of says that there's something there on the grounds. Um, he also kind of talks about 
how all you know again the the people's uh, cell phone battery, any of any equipment from any any batteries from any of the equipment on board. I mean, on uh, at the site. Well, all of a sudden, just their battery just drains way too quickly, or all of a sudden will drain, as if something is kind of sucking the energy out of all of this equipment. So, it's uh you know something he says it's definitely going on. Again, he's kind of a uh, tough looking guy. You know, uh, if you if you read the article, it gets real. He gets real honest about the stuff at the site that scares him. Um, he says. He gives one interesting story, and I'll just tell you here, but I, I, if you can, click on the article to take a look at it. But he says that one, one time he got a, a distress call from somebody that lived out at the ranch. So he immediately got in his car and started driving out towards that location. But he said he kind of felt uneasy um, as he was driving out to that location. And again, we're talking about a big ranch. There's a lot of ground to cover. So you know he had to drive out there, and it was going to take a bit. But as he's driving... And he pulls in to the, the lo- location. He says that he clearly heard a voice, not in his head, but just a voice in his car. And he was driving by himself that told him, that said these words, stop, turn around. So I thought that was kind of interesting that, you know, we're here, now we're seeing the phenomena rather than like the Bigelow types of phenomena when, or, and the Sherman type of phenomena that maybe didn't communicate. Now, now in this case, um, it looks like they're whatever whatever's happening at the ranch is telepathically or verbally or non-verbally communicating with with the the security there. So I thought that's kind of an of an interesting example. Um, and actually, within the last maybe few months, uh, I've started hearing this podcast called Skinwalker Radio. Skinwalker Radio. It actually is not necessarily all about the Skinwalker Ranch, but it 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 talks to a lot of uh, individuals that have actually worked at the ranch. So it's, it's pretty interesting to hear that first-person perspective. Um, now that, that, that they don't longer work for Bigelow, um, a lot of them don't, no longer work for Bigelow, so they, they decide to come out you know, public with their experiences. And I, and I just remember one individual that was interviewed there, and it kind of reminded me of this guy, the security guard. Um, tough-looking guy, uh, you know, kind of a guy that wouldn't get scared easily, but this guy said that, it was uh, interesting working at the site at, at Skinwalker Ranch because you know he had heard about what you know what was going on there, the types of uh, anomalies that that occurred there. But he didn't believe them too much. He said until one day, um, you know, he would he would work at the ranch for a few weeks and then would go home. And his home was in Las Vegas, which is not too far away from from the ranch. Uh, but when he would get home, he had a little baby and he had a wife there that were waiting for him. And he said that. Uh, his wife woke up in the middle of the night and kind of asked him, you know, to go check around the house because apparently she had seen what looked like a dark shape walking around the house. Um, and then a few days later, he had seen the shape as well. So it came to they they came to the realization that this started this only occurred when he would arrive home from the ranch. It's almost as if this entity this you know, shadow person, whatever you want to call it, had apparently followed them home from the ranch. So that's when it kind of hit home for him that whatever was happening at the ranch wasn't just anomalous for others, but it was now kind of affecting his personal life. And that's when he was really, he began to really think about, you know, was it the right the right place for him to work at or not? And he was kind of a military contractor, uh, security, but was all, he was also trying to do some research, um, but I thought it was kind of interesting that some of his research also involved kind of doing some ritual ritual magic out at the site. So I think he was just in general uh, kind of a new age. He had a new age kind of mentality. So he said he loved the he loved the Skinwalker Ranch because he said that he felt that it had some kind of powerful energy throughout that would allow him to kind of hone in on his uh, on his Zen, you know, to to kind of put it in new age terms. And uh, so I thought, th- I thought that was interesting. Again, that's on Skinwalker Radio. Um, but again, even even going back to this MJ Benias article, the the article itself, um, it does say that the, the the security guard that they interviewed does say that now that adamantium has taken over the site, according to them, they've within the last few years since they took over, they've captured so much more data 
than Bigelow captured in 20 years. It's hard for me to believe that because, again, I, I don't think you can really pinpoint. You, you, can't, you can't predict what the paranormal is going to do. You, you can't predict. I mean, that's exactly what it is. It's above normal. Uh, it's outside of the normal. Maybe a normal type of phenomena you can predict and you can't, you can't uh, put down data points and come up with a trend line or come up with a, a prognosis or a um, uh, prediction. But when you're talking about the paranormal, you can. So I really believe that maybe Bigelow did capture a lot of information. But again, he's never he's been hesitant to release any of that. No, none of that information is available to the public. So Adamantium, it looks like they're a lot more open. Again, they even got that cable cable show now uh, for the for the phenomena. But I believe Bigelow must have tons and tons of data. Uh, over 20 years, and again, to over 20 years, so much so much stuff could have happened. And if Adamantium is saying within the last three, four years, tons of stuff has happened. I could only imagine Bigelow. But again, I, I doubt we'll ever see that come to light. Um, I mean, maybe if, if this whole disclosure UFO movement does come to fruition in, in, in a good way for, for you know us enthusiasts of the paranormal. But if it doesn't, then I, I highly doubt that we'll see any kind of that any of that data come to light as to what what they think was going on at um at at Skinwalker Ranch. So so that hopefully that gives you a big overview of, of what the ranch is, the phenomena that occurred there, the players, uh, again starting with Terry Sherman. But just like Bigelow kind of skipped out and and you know I don't know again if he took with him a real mental conclusion, a, a good idea of what the ranch, what the phenomena in the ranch were. I want to kind of take a look at a few examples that are actually, some of these examples are, are in the, the, skin, the Hunt for the Skinwalker book. So the very last third of the book kind of goes into what are um, Tom C Colm Kelleher and George Knapp's ideas of what the phenomena could be. But I also kind of want to take a look at it from my own perspective, like I mentioned at the beginning of today's episode, where I want to kind of bring in some of the other uh, other areas that maybe we can uh, overlay onto the phenomena to really kind of see, is it something that we can explain or is it something that, again, will be pure, is, is purely paranormal? Explanations about what the Skinwalker Ranch is. That's the... Uh, that's the big, um, uh, big question, right? With anything in the paranormal, uh, particularly again in in the case of the Skinwalker Ranch, um, which is kind of considered, if you depending on the site you go to, it's basically considered kind of like the mother of all um, anomalous cases, especially now with a lot of information coming out to the public and the fact that it's uh, again you've got a TV show on the History Channel and. And a lot of different information out there, its connection with the ATIP program, with uh, Elizondo, with DeLong, Al Putoff, John Alexander, even Jacques Vallée to an extent, all connected to it and all connected to what's going on with this possible disclosure of, uh, of, the, UFO, of the existence of UFOs. So how can we even start to try to, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to try to tell you I know the answer because nobody does. But I, I mean, if you look at the evidence, just just purely based on empirical evidence, we could kind of come up with some good ideas of what what this could be. So, the first thing that I think we can we can take a look at is it is the Skinwalker Ranch a, por a portal area, portal area, similar to let's say the Bermuda Triangle, the supposed Bermuda Triangle, or the San Luis Valley in Colorado. If you're familiar with with the high strangeness that goes on there. Even uh, Point Pleasant in West Virginia with the Mothman, a lot of high strangeness type phenomena occur there. Is it a result of the collective unconscious? Again, if you're familiar with Jungian psychology, we have this concept called the collective unconscious, where in reality, um, most of our archetypes, such as the trickster or the hero or the villain, they all kind of come into our psyche or into our um into our humanity, human condition, uh, we're, we're, they're not something that we learn, but they're something that we inherit that from our ancestors. And I'm not talking about your, your, let's say your, you know, your grandmother, or your grandfather. I'm talking about your human ancestors in general. 
that these types of these types of archetypes or um, explanations of the human condition purvey throughout the human the history of humanity. So we see them and play, uh, let's say, in, in in the trickster archetype, in the in the sense that you see that happening, even when and you experience it, even when you don't intend for it to happen or experience it. That's that's what we consider an archetype. Uh, could 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 the Skinwalker Ranch be a portal area, like I said, where you see the collective unconscious? In other words, our, our collection of unconscious archetypes at play here, um, kind of creating this. I, I don't think that there are natural types of portal areas like this where they naturally occur because of the alignment of some type of geomagnetic fields. I mean, in that case, it, it could happen. I, I would say so, you know, where you do have um, maybe some type of ma magnetic lines that kind of cause uh, cause the individual in that area, certain individuals maybe to experience things in certain ways, uh, where we you know we, where you where you would where you would see maybe things that aren't really there because of the high magnetic fields in that area, the EMF that could happen. You know, it, I'm not sure if there's been studies done on each of these portal areas that have caused that. But the fact that the Shermans, uh, going back to the the wolf, all 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 of them did see this wolf, uh, two hundred pound wolf, that uh, was tame, and that all of a sudden disappeared. I, I don't know if you can purely attribute that to maybe let's say a portal area where you've got a high EMF reading, that kind of creates these types of feelings and sensations for those around. Because here you have what clearly was for them a flesh and blood animal. So if it was a flesh and blood animal, um, I, I don't think you could really attribute that to, to just a, a purely uh, sensational, a, a pure, pure sensation. Uh, so I, I really don't think it's a portal area uh, in this case. Although, again, it does sound like it could be, especially when you do have those portals that Terry saw, Terry Sherman saw in the sky. Uh, and then you also had that, the same kind of orange tunnel that the NIDS individuals saw. So you have portals in there, but is the whole ranch, the whole ranch or portal area in on its own for those reasons of let's say EMF fields kind of crisscrossing, creating um, sensations for individuals that, that that approach the ranch. I don't think there's enough evidence to say that, even though even though it's been studied quite a bit by by all the organizations that have been at the ranch. I don't think there's enough evidence. The other uh, explanation for for the ranch, uh, for the phenomena at the ranch, and this is actually more a more recent one, is infrasound. So, if you take a look at at some of the more recent articles, um, even even I believe that um, there, I, for, I forgot her name right now, but there is a, a, a paranormal investigator going around right now saying that uh, she believes that the the infrasound uh, explanation is probably the the correct one for what's happening at Skinwalker, and unfortunately is kind of a kind of a guinea pig story uh, when, when we as we you know as we approach it right now. So, for those not familiar with infrasound, it's basically uh, infrasound does occur naturally, and it's kind of a particular sound wave that can cause you to to kind of hallucinate, almost like a like a drug like LSD or um, any, any other type of hallucinogenic drug, but it occurs uh, with with sound waves that are either uh, generated man, uh, by a man-made device, or could be. There are also there there are cases of them being generated naturally as well. But in the case of of the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, these some some of the paranormal investigators that have gone around talking about it say that um, Bigelow was actually involved with uh, weapons testing high-end weapons testing, and they were using infrasound basically as a weapon to kind of uh, uh, disarm our enemies using infrasound, using these sound waves to make you either hallucinate or make you uh, do something on command. And essentially all the security personnel and all the researchers and even, again, Terry Sherman himself were all guinea pigs. And infrasound was basically the... Uh, the medicine of choice or the uh, hallucinogenic of choice to see how these individuals reacted, individuals from different fields, different perspectives, di different socioeconomics, to see how each of them reacted to, to, the, con to, to the infrasound 
going on throughout that area. Is that pro- is that plausible? I think I think so. I mean, we do see that uh, being the explanation even recently for the whole uh, Dyatlov Pass. Dyatlov Pass, if if you are familiar with that, that's something that infrasound is attributed to quite a bit. Um, now, in terms of it being something that is legitimately can legitimately be used as a like a, I wouldn't call it a bioweapon, but as an advanced weapon. I don't I don't know. I I really don't know. If we can say that that's the case here, again, especially with the, uh, I, I go back again to that wolf episode. If we think about the predator episode that Sherman had, Terry Sherman had, I could see that being, that, that could happen. Again, if you have already uh, an unconscious thought maybe about the, uh, what's going on at the site. And, and again, the, the infrasound maybe plays on your unconscious thoughts, on your unconscious fears. Just again, like the Jungian and Freudian psychology say, we, we kind of have these um, inner fears and doubts that if if you check the right boxes, again, they kind of gener- they could generate very, very um, waking dreams, types of waking unconscious waking conscious thoughts that could kind of generate into these these feelings and these visions that maybe Terry did generate something like that to, to actually create that predator type of of a creature that he saw. Uh, again, a collection of of unconscious, unconscious, and then the collective unconscious. All all of these different um, psychological archetypes could have could have been in play here if you kind of uh, it activated them using infrasound. So again, even even the fact that you could have generated a particular vision, maybe whoever was controlling this infrasound. Uh, was able to generate a particular vision on the part of Terry by generating at a, a, cer- a certain frequency of infrasound as opposed to, let's say, a different type of frequency generated and pointed at Tad or at Gwen um, at different points. So, and the same with the NIDS individuals. Um, I I want to say, though, that I, I personally don't think this is the case just because of the amount of um, people that have been there and for nobody to actually come out and say that that was the case, somebody must have known. You know, there's been hundreds of people that have that have been attached to the case. A lot of different scientists have worked there. Um, it, they none of them have said it. it. This is just a recent theory that somebody has come up and said that yeah, that they think that it was infrasound. But I really feel that you you would need a lot more evidence to prove that infrasound could even be weaponized. Um, and again, I don't think we've got that evidence yet, empirical evidence. It, it might be the case, but we don't have that empirical evidence. So the last theory I've got to talk about is, and it's kind of the one I alluded to right at the beginning of the episode. And I think for me personally, just because I'm aware of some of the uh, Indian burial grounds here in California uh, and some of the effects that have occurred when construction happens on these Indian burial grounds, I really think that on this Skinwalker Ranch site, the Sherman Ranch site, there must be an, a, an Indian burial ground that, and we've seen actually um, in in some of these uh, stories on Skinwalker Radio, or even on um, on some of these articles on Vice or other articles related to the Skinwalker Ranch, all of the individuals that have worked there indicate that whenever there is digging going on at the site, it appears that the phenomena ramps up. So. That's really the only time that they've been able to quantify or uh, quantify qualitatively uh, when there is actual phenomena occurring. So they can expect the phenomena uh, frequency to increase whenever there is actually digging going on at the site. And they actually, they actually do say that a lot of times uh, this trickster-like element at a times does um, prevent them from digging, might make some of their equipment malfunction, uh, might hide some equipment, and it might be a very, very large piece of equipment. It might be a uh, some kind of uh, a digger or some kind of uh, you know um, uh, I don't know, bulldozer or something. It it might go missing all of a sudden because the implication is that this equipment will be used for digging. As I po- like as I indicated here with the University Cal State Uni- Cal State Cal- California State University Long Beach here in California. Um, they did have an Indian burial ground, and again, there's a lot of cases of, you know, anomalous types of stuff going on near the the burial ground. So, 
I think that this is probably the most um, le legitimate, realistic explanation for what's going on at Skinwalker, especially the high strangeness types of elements. If you really can equate Bigfoot and UFOs and uh, ghosts and orbs, all of that, if you could kind of put that under the umbrella of the paranormal, and if you got all of those in one area, it's probably because, again, this is more, this is this could be a, like a, a legitimate uh, trickster or play arena, let's say an arena for the trickster archetype to kind of come into play. So it might be a, a collective unconscious of a, a result of the collective unconscious with relation to the the actual Indians that are buried there. Again, the energies involved there, whatever rituals occurred there. Um, again, we're talking about thousands of years worth of possibly burials there because again where this is this was native american land and uh that in conjunction with the collective unconscious that could actually use those 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 thoughts there from these individuals that were buried i think that that's probably what um what has what has been occurring here occurring there so i think the trickster is a very powerful archetype and uh, just like the hero archetype that we see, again, if you're familiar with Joseph Campbell and uh, the psychology of mythology, that comes into play here as well, where you can kind of see that these archetypes, um, even though we don't necessarily experience them every day consciously, they unconsciously permeate throughout our human condition. And in this area, let's say in this Skinwalker Ranch, you could see that more than anything where nothing has a pattern, sometimes things... That things are seen sometimes things are not and most of the time when people try to capture them they're not able to capture them to the point that bigelow either gave up sold it for one reason or another sold the ranch and uh, you, you're still seeing that kind of stuff happening but you're seeing it happening even now without a pattern um so i, I think it, it's it's a type of like a like a poltergeist like a you know, you know poltergeist literally means uh, noisy ghost in, in German, so it's a poltergeist slash trickster, but compounded on the fact that it's a it's happening on an Indian burial ground. They're, those are deeply connected, I feel, and I, I you know I don't I, I haven't read to see if there's been ever a um, uh, I guess an opportunity to let's say to bless the area, to have a blessing done at the ranch, uh, let's say to have a mass, a Catholic mass set at the ranch, or anything of those na of that nature, but. I, I'd be curious to see uh, the phenomena itself to see if there's any changes if those kinds of things were done rather than treat it as for purely scientific reasons because I think that's what has been done so far. It's been it's been treated as a scientific lab. Um, unfortunately, again, these are real individuals if if buried there, which I think are buried there. These these the Indian burial ground. Um, if you if you disturb anything like that, that's probably not going to lead to good things. And I think. A lot of these uh, uh, whistleblowers that have come out after the fact, once Bigelow sold the ranch, have indicated that that they felt that it, it was a beautiful place, a holy place, a powerful place, but that something had been disturbed. And uh, unfortunately, um, in this case, you know, no, nobody really was able to to see it when they were there. But now that hopefully people are are now starting to speak up about their experiences there. Uh, we can maybe see that happen sooner or later in terms of possibly getting the area blessed and um, and 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 hopefully giving those individuals their uh, true true peace now and now in the afterlife because I I think that's again that's I think the the more power, most powerful and uh, most probable explanation to what's going on um, at, at the ranch itself. So that brings us to the end of the show. I think this is the longest show I've done so far for the Paranormal Nothing. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope. I apologize again if I over overlooked any of the facts. It is a lot of facts to go through, and I didn't cover everything. There's a lot of at play even now with the, this new movie, Hunt for the Skinwalker, produ produced by uh, Jeremy Corbell, and uh, also involves uh, George Knapp. So if you haven't taken, if you haven't seen it, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and include a, a link for it at the bottom on the show notes. And again, if you haven't read the book, Hunt for the Skinwalker, very, very highly recommend it. It's actually a pretty fast read, but it, there's just so much data in it that you'll probably have to sit there with a pen to make sure you didn't uh, you underline all the important facts, dates, and names, uh, because there is a lot of information in there. And again, if you haven't um, 
seen that article on vice.com by MJ Benias. I'm going to go ahead and include a link to that as well. Um, and overall, hope you've enjoyed the episode. Hope you've gained some information about the, the, the ranch and maybe it's motivated you to do your own research. If you are um, on the West Coast, though, um, I don't recommend that you go out there because, again, it still is private property. I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't want uh, to encourage that at all, just like, you know, we don't want to encourage people to invade uh, anybody else's private property, right? So, but it is a, continues to be a very uh, enigmatic place. I, I don't know if we'll ever really find an answer to what, what is going on there, but I hope we do, just like we're hopefully getting close to possible disclosure or not, not necessarily disclosure of alien, the alien um, presence, but maybe just a disclosure of what, what, is, what is the government up to uh, with relation to supposed UAPs, right? And I want to keep my mind open and I hope everybody else does as, as to the Skinwalker as well, the Skinwalker Ranch. And at the same time, know that, you know, again, our, our country, beautiful country, the United States, um, is founded again on um, principles. And at the same time, these Na Native American people that lived here also had their own principles and this was their land. So, you know, we don't, we can't explain everything away just with purely science because again, they were here before we came. So this could be one of those areas where, again, uh, something is again beyond science that we can't really explain with purely science. So again, thank you again for listening. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. And uh, if you'd like to comment, let me a note. Let, let me know what you think about today's episode. What do you think about my assertions? Um, otherwise, uh, hope everybody is staying safe uh, due to this uh, COVID nineteen, which we're hopefully going to be uh, getting out getting out of soon. You know, as as the summer comes to an end, uh, hopefully we're we're out of this uh, first wave. And I and I hope you know I pray to God there is no second wave, so we can all get out out of our house and back to our daily lives. But um, otherwise, talk to you guys soon, and God bless. Thank you.